Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob, one of the pastors here. It's great to have you with us. If this is your very first time visiting with us today, we have a desk in the foyer I would like to invite you to go to after the service. You'll notice a big round dot on the wall that says, I'm new, and there'll be a table underneath it staffed by somebody. If you would go there today after the service, if this is your first time here, uh, we have a gift for you, and we'd love to have the chance to, uh, to get to know you a little bit. Also, I wanted to let you know that I'm starting on next Sunday night at 6 p.m. here. I'm going to be offering a, a, a kind of a connecting time Bible study class. Uh, we're going to be talking about spiritual disciplines, the things that we do to help us grow in our faith, and also spiritual gifts, the ways that God gifts us so that we can serve others. And so if you've been looking for a place just to kind of come and connect, we're going to have lots of discussion, a chance to visit together around tables. If that would be a, a, a rich place for you, then we invite you to come at 6 p.m. and you can register um, for that online. Uh, this is uh, September. It does have a sense of newness and a freshness about it. I don't know if your routine changes much. I know I've been in really looking forward to some new routine, new schedule, a little bit more structure for myself as we head into the fall. It just feels new. It feels good. I just kind of love this time of year. And if the heat continues, I'll be even happier. Um, and we hope that you'll get a chance to join us outside afterwards as well. But And there does seem to be Hopefully, I think a little new optimism in this fall compared to the last few years as well, that maybe some of the things that you're planning, maybe some of the things that we're planning together as a church, uh, we'll be able to continue on with them without them being interrupted. And maybe even in that season, it's gotten you thinking a little bit about what does it look like for you to be a part of your local church again? That even in this September season with lots of new and exciting things, it's kind of a time for you to be thinking about, you know, for some of you, uh, I'm going to return to in-person services. For some people, maybe returning to volunteering. Maybe it's time to connect again with my life group or my Bible study group. I know for some people, um, it's bringing kids, kind of getting them back into routine again, getting them back with their small groups so they can have those spiritual influences in their life. Back to youth group where they can develop those friendships and have that environment where their faith can be nurtured and grown. It's just kind of that new season, and it really is. It kind of feels like we're beginning again or starting again. Having said that, I also know that in this new season, things are still a little bit unclear, that there's lots of things that we're kind of trying to figure out, and we kind of think we know, but things still tend to feel a little bit unclear. I know we feel this as leaders and as staff here as the church, kind of like, is anybody going to return to in-person services again? I don't know. We were talking about it this week. How many kids might come this week to River Kids? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How many youth leaders are we going to need if we're going to have like one youth leader for so many students? How many students are going to be back this week? Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, we just are living in this time where so much uh, is, unnew to, or is unclear to us. I know for some of you, uh, staying online and having um, that option is the wise choice for you to do right now, given health concerns of yours or family members or just the season that you're in, that that is a wise choice for you. So the question then becomes, well, how do I stay connected to the church beyond just watching a service um, throughout the week or on Sunday mornings? It's a question. It's a kind of one of those things that's unclear. We've heard from some people who said, I'm not coming back. I'm not. In some cases, these last few years have been so hard on their faith They've got doubts or questions or concerns, and they're just not coming back. For other people, they're not coming back because, well, <laughs> why would I come back to people? I mean, have you know what people are like? I can be home well, by myself with my coffee on the couch. I can watch the service at 10 or 9.30 or 11. I can watch it Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday night. Like, I can do it whenever I want to do it. I'll read the email. I'll send a few bucks in by email. I can just, like, do my own thing now. And is that what it means to belong to a local church? I just kind of pick and choose what I need, and then I just kind of do my own thing outside of that. These are the questions we're asking. I know that these are some of the questions that you're asking too. In this season where things feel a little bit unclear. I also know that for some, you know, people have pro been prognosticating that the on, uh, advent of online church is going to mean the end to church in person. That people are never coming back. That it appeals to our consumeristic spirits. That just we want to do what we want to do. And then for others, I know that they need online. It's a really helpful gift, and we want to continue to provide opportunities for people to connect who need it in this season for, for other reasons. 
I also know that some of you who are watching online today, you don't live anywhere near this church facility and that you join us from outside of the St. John area. And we think that's wonderful. In fact, next week, we're going to have a child dedication for people that don't even live in this province who are coming back to St. John for a child dedication. Um, And we're going to be having an opportunity in the fall for those of you who watch online from outside of the St. John region to gather together online to ask the question, what can we do to help you grow in your faith and continue to, to flourish as a person that's trying to follow Christ? So as exciting as this time of year is, there's lots of stuff that's still unclear that we are all trying to figure out together. Now, it won't surprise you that in the history of the church, and as we read the scriptures, there have been lots of seasons where God's people have found themselves in a season that's exciting, but also unclear. That's really, there's lots of great stuff happening, but also there's a lot of questions and also uncertainty. And so let me just remind you of a few things, that as we start into this new season, while it might be new to us, it's not new to God. While this season might feel uncertain to us, God's not uncertain about what He's going to do and how it is that He's going to interact with us. And so over these next four weeks, we are going to look at the stories of four individuals who found themselves in what should have been a very exciting season, but found themselves in a difficult space, and they needed to start again. We're going to look at the accounts of four different people or groups who found themselves kind of struggling to figure out what is it going to look like for me to start again. And so this morning, all I'm going to do is set context for those four stories, and then we'll jump into the first one next week. Because those stories fall or lay in the shadow of two of the most important and most significant events in the entire New Testament. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the birth of the church. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the birth of the church. On one side of these four stories that we're going to look at is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is born. He had a life of teaching about the kingdom of God. He demonstrates through his life what the kingdom of God looks like. However, because of human sin that's baked into each and every one of us, There's a need for there to be an atonement for that sin, a once and for all sacrifice that will deal for sins past, present, and future, and will set us in right standing with God so we can be in relationship with him. Thus, the crucifixion, Jesus dying on a Roman cross, paying the price for our sins. And then, three days later, rising again and appearing to over 500 people. Now, the resurrection was not just a happy ending to a sad event. The resurrection was significant for a number of reasons. Let me just mention three. Number one, it was a confirmation. Jesus said he was going to be resurrected, and he was. He made a promise, and he kept it. He kept his word, meaning that we can trust him today when he gives us his word on other things. That Jesus, in terms of coming back to life, confirms for us that he is somebody that we can trust with our lives today. It was also a statement of hope that just as Jesus was raised to new life, the first to be resurrected, it means that you and I can have the promise of resurrection as people of faith when we pass away as well. Which is why if you've ever been to a Christian funeral, to a service where someone has faith, we have those words, we grieve, but not like people without hope. For we know and believe that God has given the gift of eternal life and that this life is held in the hands of Christ himself. So it's hope. Thirdly, it's victory. It's a sense that Jesus in his life and ministry had shown power over the demonic, power over nature, power over sickness, power over weather. And, but to that point in his ministry, death had batted a thousand. It had always won and it had always had the last word. Until the resurrection. And when Jesus is resurrected and walks out of the tomb, he makes the statement that he now holds the keys. He owns sin and death. He owns them once and for all. So the resurrection, this event that happens at the end of Jesus' life, is the perfect and powerful completion of his mission and ministry, so central to our faith that Paul rightly says, if Jesus was not physically resurrected, Christian faith is useless and that we are all wasting our time here today. So, we're going to look at these four stories, sandwiched between the resurrection, and the other thing they're sandwiched between is the birth of the church. 
Now, when I say church, I know that many of us would have different thoughts and feelings about that word. I know for some of you, that's a difficult word because of some experiences that you have had. When Jesus talks about the church, he means this, the bride of Christ, the one that he loves with an unconditional love and has given his life for. To Jesus, the church is his active presence living in the world today. The church are you and I commissioned to go and empowered to go, and Jesus uses these words that are not mine, that we would do greater things than he had done. Think about that. Does it not even feel a bit blasphemous as you hear it? It feels blasphemous for me to say it. That the church is not a social club. It's not an institution. It's not a place to go hide away from the awful world and get away from things. Not at all. In fact, we have this beautiful description in Acts chapter 2 of what the church looks like when it's living out its true calling. Let me just read these verses to you from Acts uh, chapter 2, 42 to 47. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all but the believers met together in one place. They shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and gave to those who had need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of the people. And to each day the Lord added to their numbers those who were being rescued or those who were joining them and being saved. This is the description of the birth of the church. God's people doing what Jesus had asked them to do and, in fact, doing greater things. That the gospel spread throughout the world and it's the reason that you and I are here today. So if you're flipping through your Bibles, you're going to get through John chapter 20. You're going to get the story of the resurrection, the hope and foundation of our Christian faith. Then you've got chapters 20, chapter 20 and 21, and then you've got the birth of the church. And in these two chapters, chapter 20 and 21, you've got a story, four stories of people who had followed Jesus. They were there. They saw him. They heard him. They were part of his inner circle. They'd seen his miracles. They'd seen the life transformation going on and on. And you might ask yourself, well, then what are they doing in those two chapters? Well, I bet they're at the print shop. They're getting posters made. They're getting gospel tracts printed. They're getting ready to go out and do what Jesus had called them to do. They're at home. They're packing their luggage. They're calling their boss saying, I'm going to need some more time off. I'm going to be away for a little bit. I got this thing, right? This is what we would think them to be doing. But as we're going to see over these next four weeks, in John chapter 20, John chapter 21, nothing could be further from the truth. That following the resurrection of Jesus in just 50 days before the church was born, we see that these people are struggling. They are not doing very well at all. They have just experienced loss. They've experienced grief and they're wrestling with sadness, they're discouraged, they're full of fear, and some of them have actually quit and completely walked away from the calling that Jesus had on their life. Now, if I was, and I'm not, if I was Jesus and I came back from the dead to see my disciples all gone, living sad lives, fearful lives, discouraged lives, and having quit altogether, I'd fire them all and get new ones. Wouldn't you? You'd be tempted. It's not what Jesus does. When Jesus is resurrected, he comes back and he goes looking for them. One by one and group by group. Jesus goes and finds them. This is beautiful, gospel-soaked accounts of God who does not give up on his people but goes and finds them. We've got the story of Mary, who is sad thinking Jesus' death is once and for all final, and then Jesus comes looking for her and turns her into the very first evangelist for the resurrection. You've got the disciples who are in a room, doors locked, full of fear, hiding out with no idea what's going on in the world around them, and Jesus comes looking for them, and they leave filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got Thomas, who's doubting. He's doubting the resurrection, and maybe you're in that space too. 
His mind and his heart just cannot compute these facts. And then Jesus comes looking for him, and he leaves with newfound faith. You've got Peter. (laughs) Peter, who'd been called from fishing for fish to go and fish for men, who now, after Jesus has resurrected, has completely quit, and he's gone back to fishing for fish. And then Jesus comes looking for him. And at the end of the account, Jesus, or Peter is back fishing for fish. Four accounts of people who were struggling, four accounts of Jesus coming looking for them, and four accounts of people who got to start again. Now, as we walk through these accounts over the next two weeks, there's two things that I'm really, really praying for and hoping will happen uh, for all of us, myself included. The first is this. That as we go through these accounts of people who are in a really difficult space, who are really, really struggling, that for some of you today, you would hear the message that Jesus has come looking for you too. That if this has been a difficult season for you, if you find yourself afraid, fearful, if you're struggling with grief, if you're just kind of feeling exhausted and overwhelmed, that you would hear that Jesus has come looking for you as well. As we go through these stories, I hope that you're captured by the truth that Jesus comes looking for us, even if it is means that he's going to find us where he's already found us before. He's not embarrassed by us. He's not giving up on us. He's willing to give us the chance to start again. That's the first hope. My second hope is this, for us as a congregation. I hope that these stories, and as we go through them and kind of wrestle with these accounts, they will inspire us to be the church and to recapture that missionary spirit that came upon the apostles in those very first days that will just wake something up in our hearts again. As we work through this series, I hope it will motivate us to be the presence of Jesus today in the city of St. John with the people that we live, work, and play with. That means, for some of us, helping kind of giving us a boldness to reconnect with people who used to attend here but don't anymore, or people that we haven't seen in a little bit, to get past any kind of awkward embarrassment about, you know, I don't know if I want to say anything, I don't want to reach out, I don't know what to say, but just give us a boldness to do that. Um, I have made a fool of myself on multiple occasions, reaching out to people, introducing myself to people that I've met before, and on and on and on. So I invite you to join me in humiliation um, in trying this out. Not in a weirdy, guilty, how come you aren't in church kind of a way. No. But how are you? How are you doing? These last two years have been tough. Is there anything you need? Can I be praying for you? Is there any support that you need in this season? I hope as we go through these accounts of Jesus going looking for people, it will awaken us a desire to do the same for our own church family, but not just our church family, for our city as well that we will remember that we are a local church that is the living presence of Jesus in our communities. Not just when we gather here on Sunday, but when you go home, when you go to work, when you're at soccer practice, when you're hanging out with your friends, you are the living presence of Jesus in those environments as well. If you've been on our board, if you've been around our congregation, I have a quote that I like to inflict upon you. Let me inflict it on you one more time. In fact, we're going to read it together. It's one of my favorite quotes um, from Erwin McManus. So I'm going to invite us to read this out loud with maybe a modest level of enthusiasm, shall we? Let's start. Some people think the church is for them, but in reality, we are the church and we exist for the world. Let's try it one more time. Some people think the church is for them, But in reality, we are the church, and we exist for the world. Our job is not survival. Our job is not just to keep the machinery running. We exist for the city of St. John. Who are waking up today, maybe sad, maybe like the disciples, grieving, maybe fearful, maybe done doubting. Maybe they've completely walked away from their faith. Maybe they're thinking about walking away from marriages. Maybe they're thinking about walking away from all kinds of things that are life-giving in their life, but they're just had it. And they're wondering, does anybody care? And we are the church for this city, one of the churches. Now, I'm thinking too, it could be really tempting in this season just to say, well, you know what? 
not a bad group of people here. We had a good group at the first service. I guess we're okay. And just to be content and think, well, I'm just going to go on my merry way and we'll just have this thing going on and that's great. This is not a season for us to be content. But as we work through these accounts of Jesus coming, looking for lost people who need to be invited to start again, that it would awaken something in our own hearts to live out that spirit today as well. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you come looking for us. And maybe even in this service this morning as we've been singing and praying and talking about this, the need to start again in our own faith resonates with us. Lord, today I pray you'd give us the courage to pay attention to that and to take a step to reach out, to have a conversation, to do something about it. We thank you that no matter where we are, you're right there with us. And Lord, today I just pray that over these next number of weeks as we wrestle with these stories together, that God, they would awaken something in our whole church family, a desire, a longing to be the presence of Jesus in our city right now. Lord, we know so many people, all of us, in our own circles who are just going through difficult seasons, finding this time real challenging. And Lord, we pray that in some way you might use us to point people to you. We give you the thanks in Jesus' name.